So the theme of our closing panel is how to manage the many forums for space sustainability. As we all know, a sustainable future in space depends on having effective governance institutions and collaborative fora. And we just heard about two of these that are playing a very significant role in enhancing space sustainability and developing co uh, cooperative governance solutions to space sustainability challenges. To date, we have a variety of such institutions and fora. These can be found inside various UN offices, in standing UN committees, and in specialized UN agencies. It can also be found in self-organized groups of states, in national policy and regulatory entities, and as part of private sector standards and best practice initiatives. Given the rising salience of space sustainability and more voices joining the conversation, this multitude of fora will likely increase over the coming years. So with so many initiatives, how do we avoid duplication and dilution of efforts? How do we promote coordination and cooperation so that the various efforts are complementary and do not cut across each other, but rather act in concert towards a coherent goal? How can we find ways in which states and non-state actors can work together on space sustainability efforts? To discuss these questions, we have a distinguished panel of experts from government, industry, and civil society. Beginning on my left, we have Hugo André Costa, who is an executive board member of the Portuguese Space Agency. Next to him, we have Ryan Guilleta, who is a lead foreign affairs office in the Office of Space Affairs in the US State Department. Then John Janka, Chief Officer for Global Government Affairs and Regulatory Matters at Viasat. Angeli Moledina, she is a Chief Impact Innovation and Governance Officer at the Sustainable Markets Initiative. And then on the far end of the uh, lineup, we have uh, Namakura Kimitake, he is Deputy Assistant Minister in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan. So thank you to all of you for joining our discussion today. So I'd like to start by looking at how our understanding of space sustainability has evolved over time. And uh, I would like to begin with you, uh, Nakamura-san. Given your vast amount of international experience, how have you seen the topic of space sustainability handled in the different fora, and how has that changed over time? Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm Kimi Nakamura. Nice to meet you all. Um, I think the way the rules on space sustainability uh, made has evolved over the last 40 years. Uh, in my view, the change has been uh, from a top-down approach to a bottom-up approach. Uh, I mean, this evolution has taken place in different contexts. The first, first is the shift from government-led rulemaking to private sector-led rulemaking. In the decade of 2000, developed space-pairing countries began to create international guidelines to order and strengthen their efforts to reduce debris generation. Uh, obviously, the 2002 IADC guidelines were the first of these. Later, as you are aware, uh, the United Nations also created guidelines. These negotiations were uh, conducted on an intergovernmental basis. Uh, then individual countries uh, required companies under their jurisdiction to comply with the guidelines through uh, domestic legislation. <coughs> so it can be called a top-down approach. Then in the 20, uh, 2010, um, new methods were introduced. The first is ISO standards, which are not an intergovernmental organization, and compliance with these guy standards is not legally mandated. Uh, these standards have the function of guiding the behavior of the companies, uh, since adherence to those guidelines uh, enhances their reputation in the marketplace. However, although ISO is a non-governmental organization, uh, the negotiating positions of the participating organizations in each country are often influenced by their respective governments. 
So therefore, this is a moderate approach that can hardly be described as either purely top-down or purely bottom-up. And the World Economic Forum to Space Sustainability Rating, which began full operation in the 2020th, is a privately created rating system. Uh, it is intended to evaluate and score the debris management practices of space companies and influence the market's evaluation of their products and services. This is, this is an attempt to create peer pressure uh, within the marketplace without counting on the legal power under domestic laws and regulations. Similar efforts can be found in the collection, collection of best practices uh, compiled by the Space Safety Coalition and others. This is definitely a bottom-up approach. So another aspect of the trend uh, towards a bottom-up emphasis is the growing tendency of rules to be decided by groups of like-minded countries or in some cases by individual countries unilaterally taking steps to set the tone rather than creating universal rules at the United Nations. In other words, even when governments uh, make the rules, uh, the way they do is changing. Of course, there are still rules to be made at the United Nations, such as the long-term sustainability guidelines. But in an increasingly divided world after Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the hurdle to decision-making at the United Nations is rising. In response to these structural changes, there are more and more examples of groups of like-minded countries deciding on rules or countries coming up with their own measures to set the tone for future universal rules. As we have seen in the field of space sustainability, uh, multiple tools are already available and their functions are different from each other. If we want to achieve anything in terms of space sustainability, uh, we need to be familiar with the characteristics of these tools. And I think it is quite useful to understand the major trends that I have just described. I will stop there. Thank you, Nakamura-san, for that uh, excellent and comprehensive des description of the trends over um, the last uh, few years or, or decades even. Um, so um, I'd like to uh, shift from looking at the trends to a kind of a, a more recent snapshot of the various dimensions of space sustainability as we understand them today. And for that, I would like to turn to Hugo. Um, Hugo, in May, Portugal and the United Nations Office uh, for Outer Space Affairs hosted a conference in Lisbon called Management and Sustainability of Outer Space Activities. What were some of the major takeaways from that event? Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you for having me here, for inviting the Portuguese Space Agency to, to be present. And uh, last year, we were with you in, uh, in New York, and we kicked off the Lisbon Conference on Management and Sustainability of Outer Space Activities. So it's a pleasure for us to be here back one year later to ex exactly express what, uh, what happened in this event. And for those who don't know exactly what's the conference that we organized, um, back in 2021, the Secretary General of UN decided to organize the Summit of the Future. That's going to happen this year in September. And, um, and the Summit of the Future will look into different areas and to the future of, of United Nations, and space is going to be one uh, of, the, of the areas. So Portugal, back in 2022, uh, proposed to UNOSA to host um, a conference to look into the issues of the management sustainability of outer space activities. And uh, last year, uh, it was issued by the Secretary General, the Policy Brief 7, that was dedicated to space, uh, in which um, it states that the three points, which are space traffic management, space debris, and space resources, the three t uh, key points to be uh, addressed during the Summit of the Future. So the conference was organized, um, it was organized in, in May uh, this year, but beforehand we ho hosted two virtual symposiums, one in November and uh, one in March uh, this year. The first one was on the technical issues and the second one on the policy matters. And one of the goals was to have this multi-stakeholder approach. So we invited industry, we invited academia, we invited member states um, for the different, uh, for the different uh, for the symposiums, the virtual symposiums, also for the one in, 
uh, in Lisbon. And the event in Lisbon, we have more than 200 participants, uh, 50 member states registered, uh, 31 member states uh, made their statements. And the outcomes of this meeting was the Lisbon Declaration Outer Space. So the Lisbon Declaration Outer Space was written by, uh, by, the, by Portugal, but we were collecting the inputs from the different symposiums, from the technical symposium, from the policy symposium, and also from the, um, uh, from the discussions we had then in, in May. But already in, uh, in April, we'll we we published during the legal subcommittee at, uh, at Copus uh, a first version of what was already uh, part of the discussions that, that we had. And during the legal subcommittee of, uh, of Copus, we could collect inputs from member states directly, also from regional groups. And this was also a process that we invited the regional groups to, to, to step in and to join in the written of, of this declaration. So although it was uh, written by Portugal, so we led the way, but we could try to be as much uh, inclusive as possible to bring the member states and also all of those who have participated in, in the meetings. And uh, after the Lisbon Declaration, so after the May meeting where we presented the declaration and mem much member states were um, uh, in favor and, and supportive of the declaration, we presented now at COPUS and we also had a very strong co-sponsorship of, of the document that we presented. Uh, and the document can be, um, uh, of course, if you go to the COPUS website, you can find the, the Lisbon Declaration. But very briefly, uh, the six points from the Lisbon Declaration uh, highlights the Copus as the main platform to continue to have these discussions on, on space and um, uh, the appropriate forum to have it. It also um, uh, stated that we need to advance on multilateral uh, efforts uh, to keep the peaceful and use, uh, use of uh, outer space and we need to have this go government and multi-stakeholder cooperation. Uh, we need to uh, to have, uh, and it was already stated during uh, today and yesterday, have a, a, a really multi-stakeholder participation and um, a multi-sectoral uh, participation to develop norms, rules, principles to, to work on the sustainability for, for space and also on the space governance. And for example, could create uh, platforms within the committee of, uh, of, of COPUS that could accelerate and facilitate the discussions on, uh, to implement then the, these rules. Um, also, it was highlighted the international collaboration and transparency and clarity of the different policies and regulations acro um, across the different forums that already exist, so it's very important. A very important point on the youth, that we need to bring also youth into the discussion, uh, not just to have their point of view today, but also to uh, ensure that uh, uh, there's going to be a... Uh, this view will continue throughout uh, the years, and so we need to have youth uh, already with us, and also highlighting the importance of the Summit of the Future that is going to happen in, in September uh, this year. So for us, we felt it was a, a very good process. Uh, we tried to be, again, as inclusive as possible. We keep br briefing uh, couples in the different subcommittees about the different um, activities that we're doing, the outcomes from each of the sessions. Different reports were produced uh, for the different symposiums, also for the, um, for, for the conference. And then there is this document, the Lisbon Declaration, that is a summary of uh, all that was discussed that can be used now uh, by member states and uh, by other forums to, to see what we can move next to the next step. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Thanks for describing the Lisbon Declaration, which I think has some aspirational characteristics as well, right? And so um, I want to then turn to another aspirational initiative, and I mentioned in my opening remarks for the panel the emergence of a number of space sustainability initiatives. Um, among these, one of the more aspirational ones is the Astra Carta. And so um, I'd like to ad address my next question to Angeli. Um, so King Charles III, when, when he was still Prince of Wales, uh, gave a speech at the 2022 edition of the Summit for Space Sustainability in which he announced the Astra Carta Initiative. And almost exactly a year later, he formally launched it on the 28th of June, 2023. And I know a number of colleagues uh, were uh, present at the launch of, of the event, and it was an exciting day for all of us. The Astra Carta is now just over one year old. How has it progressed in establishing a roadmap for the private sector to align its sustainability goals with those of other stakeholders? 
Thank you very much. Um, so let me just take a little step back. So His Majesty King Charles III, as you mentioned, um, launched uh, the Astra Carta last year, but he actually launched the Sustainable Markets Initiative in 2020. But he's been on this um, visionary um, road of sustainability for the last five decades. So he's been a real pioneer in the space. And his vision for space sustainability, you know, has been long in the making. Um, we have two mandates at the SMI. We have the Terra Carta, which is effectively the rights of nature. And then we have the Astra Carta, which is effectively the rights of space. Not only talking about space sustainability, but then also the downstream applications of space for sustainability on Earth. The SMI has over 250 global CEOs. We're a private sector-led organization. Um, his vision was very much that the private sector is the one who's going to bring the capital to mobilize the transition, um, working with governments and working with all other stakeholders. So we have over 250 global CEOs operating um, in um, all, all aspects of the, uh, of the globe, but also we have regional councils um, in China, Africa, India, um, as well as setting one up in North America soon and Brazil. Um, we have industry transition hubs, and we have over 22 of them, and we also have financial players. And I think the trinity of having all country finance and industry has been really, really critical and important, because it's when you get the actors actually talking together, trying to drive big systems change, is where you can identify the problems and then potentially the solutions. Now, all of our transition hubs are actually very interested in the Astra Carta because as they look to transition their industries, the applications of space for them is huge. Um, every single one of our hubs um, has an interest in it um, and they really are looking towards space as future growth opportunities. You mentioned the Astra Carta is um, aspirational and visionary. Um, it is, but it's also really important that it's a practical roadmap as well. So we call ourselves the coalition. We started off the coalition of the willing. We're now actually the coalition of the doing. So very important that we take the roadmaps and the visions and we practically work out what is the delivery plan and how are we all going to implement this together. So it's incredibly important that we all collaborate on this issue. It's also relevant that we're all learning as we go along and the cross-industry learnings are very important and we're also amplifying the messages um, whether that is to the youth or citizens but also amplifying the great innovation that's happening and um, the success stories um, that are out there. Practically we have an advisory council um, and we've just launched our space task force hub as well with very defined objectives and delivery mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's also important that the incentive structure is correct um, because that's how the private sector is really going to mobilize the capital. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, I hope that didn't distract you from finishing your, <laughs> your point. Can well, I do that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, dis description of the um, the, ast the goals uh, of the Astra Carta, how, it's, how it fits in with finance and industry, and I, I hope we'll come back to some of those points later on in the discussion. Um, I'd now like to turn to some of the private sector views on how space sustainability issues are being addressed at the national and international level. And um, John, I'd like to address this question to you. So Viasat is a company that operates in many jurisdictions around the world and has participated actively in the ITU processes. What has been your experience of how space sustainability matters are addressed by companies and governments in the different national and international contexts? Thank you, Peter. Let me try to answer that in terms of mindset rather than procedure, if you will. Um, I, I think in terms of mindset, uh, particularly over the past four years, we're seeing a growing awareness and recognition that the portion of space near Earth on which we rely for many, many things in our lives is a limited resource. The universe may be infinite and mind-bogglingly big, but the portions of space that we use for communication, science, defense, security, 
um, are not infinite, they're limited. Uh, I think we're also seeing a growing awareness that there are wonderful opportunities we have in that portion of space because of new technologies and innovation. And that's wonderful, but we're also seeing that the exponential consumption of space that's occurred in the past few years is a growing threat to shared access to space by the entire world. So what does that mean? I think we're coming around to a recognition that we no longer can rely just on best practices. Best practices are good, they're a start, uh, but we've seen that technology, as it often does in other cases, has outpaced the law. And we need new rules because the rules we had for a prior era, era no longer work today. I think we also see a growing recognition. I know one of the prior speakers mentioned youth. I have two children who are, who are in their early 30s, and I see them paying attention to these issues and these trends. And I think we're seeing is that the youth, the, the next generation that's going to govern us, is increasingly recognized that they don't want to see a repeat of what we did with plastics. Right? When plastics came out, they were the most innovative, best thing in the world. We couldn't get enough of them. But now today, we're trying to put the genie back in the bottle. And no one wants to repeat that. So there is a recognition, and I think uh, Artie Halla spoke about this, about taking a holistic approach to the situation, facilitating innovation, but doing it in a way that is sustainable and that allows new services, but also protects our environment. Thank you, John. So now I'd like to turn the focus to the multilateral fora and ask the question, are these fora fit for purpose in terms of addressing space sustainability issues? And as we know, space sustainability has grown in salience uh, in these multilateral fora, such as UN Copus and ITU. So, Ryan, I'd like to address my next question to you. As a member of the US delegation to Copus, um, what have been some of your key observations, both positive and negative, about how the forum operates and serves its mission with regard to um, addressing space sustainability concerns? Sure. Uh, thank you, Peter, and to Secure World and the, and the Cabinet Office of Japan for inviting me here. And I think the, the short answer to your question is yes, I think that th they are fit for purpose, uh, but I think it is more important than ever to have kind of a robust multilateral system of engagement but also more difficult than ever to do that. And, and I think those kind of two conflicting things have, have really kind of challenged the system, but have still been able to get, you know, very positive results out of that. And, you know, to, to your point as well, in terms of how, you know, UN copious functions, I think there are a lot of really positive things that come out of that. I mean, first and foremost, to get 106 countries in a room together is very difficult to do. And, and countries that run the gamut of, you know, using space-based data and maybe just kind of starting to design or, or potentially launch their own satellites to countries that are have active space exploration and human exploration programs, all in a room, all have a voice and in a forum that operates by consensus. So anybody can say no for, for any reason. And then, you know, the committee and, and the members of that have to try to address those concerns in order for it to move forward. So I think that that is a really powerful force that the UN offers. And I also think it kind of benefits from the fact that it, it's kind of seen as a more impartial territory. You know, one thing that uh, a lot, some um, speakers have mentioned is the establishment of this uh, action team for lunar activities consultation or ATLAC, which is meant to be this multilateral, multi-stakeholder kind of coordination mechanism for all of the kind of burgeoning activities that are gonna take place in and around the moon. And I think the UN is a great forum to convene and have those conversations <coughs> because everyone is, is there for the most part and everyone can have a voice in those conversations. So I think that those are things that Copuus does um, just really well in general and also kind of bringing issues to the attention of all the member states there. You know, speaking as, as but a humble bureaucrat who is not a scientific expert in things, you know, when Dark and Quiet Skies first kind of came to Copuus three or four years ago, it's something that I, I was not aware of. I know our astronomical community and others certainly were. But I think, you know, when a small group of countries brought that to the committee 
and you know, we all brought that back to our capitals to talk about it and say, you know, where are we on this issue, et cetera. I think that can really also mobilize a lot of change and attention within individual governments you know, to try to address that issue and, and then find a way for copious to address that issue. So I think there are a lot of positive things that come out of it. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that there are also some things that Copious maybe isn't the greatest at, uh, you know, operating at the moment. And we can cut this part for Artie if she's watching at home. But this is, you know, more on member <laughs> states, I would think. And, you know, I think part of it is that it can be a bit stuffy and procedural. You know, I, I think Copious, as you see it now, is a lot of statements being read in the plenary. And, and that's important in the sense that, you know, you're reporting on your national activities, you're sharing that information with others, but sometimes that is not conducive to very interactive back and forths and conversations. And I think sometimes there can be a hesitancy on the part of delegations to kind of maybe speak out of turn or things like that. So I think having a, finding a mechanism by which there can be a bit more of a kind of interactive conversation would very much help Copious, I think, advance its work. And you can see that sometimes in the working groups and experts, expert groups that form. Um, but I think having a more concerted effort there. And I think another kind of theme that we've seen a lot from this um, uh, conference so far is the importance of incorporating those private sector voices in those conversations as well. And I think Copious also maybe doesn't have the greatest way to do that as of now compared to some other UN fora. You know, on the US delegation, we do have private sector advisors come. We have a whole process for that. I see people in this room who have served on our delegation. And it really does help us better understand the issues and also convey perspectives and ideas that other delegations may not be aware of. And I think we would welcome that in turn as well. So I think figuring out a better way to incorporate that into Copious, I think is gonna be a really important step moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think it's, that's a big challenge that Copus faces. Uh, if we can somehow uh, overcome that challenge and harness the Vienna spirit of consensus, that would be absolutely magic. Uh, but continuing on this uh, theme of multilateral institutions, the, the UN is holding a summit of the future in September in which space will be part of the agenda. And among the UN member states that have been very involved in the preparations for these discussions is Portugal. So um, Hugo, to, to you, how, how have you worked to bring in the commercial sector and other non-governmental actors in Portugal's events supporting the lead up to the summit of the future? And are there certain messages about space sustainability that have resonated with those actors in your experience? Uh, th thank you, Peter. Well, it w the main goal of, uh, of the conference was exactly to have this multi-stakeholder approach, right? So we did, of course, uh, have to, we had to engage with, uh, uh, with the industry and also with academia to, to have their voice heard the, um, uh, in the preparation of, uh, of, uh, of the conference and as a contribution to the summit of the future. So this was one of the main points when we started was to, to invite them and to bring them in, uh, uh, to the conference. Um, the other point was in the conference uh, that we organized, it was in two days, and the first day was a conference uh, type of setup. Uh, we all know how conferences work, right? But uh, not everyone perhaps knows how COPUS works. And so one of the things that we did on the second day, and because the second day, and, and we must think that the summit of the future is an exercise for, by the member states, so this exercise should also be an exercise for member states. And therefore, on the second day, we set up the room as in a couple style uh, room where all the member states uh, sit with their name tags and their, their flags. And, uh, but the industry was also involved. It, they were in the room. Uh, they were um, also the academia. So they can have a, a look and feel on how Copus works in the, without being at, uh, at Copus, right? So w we believe that this was also important so both uh, can understand how the others work. Now, in terms of, of the takeaways from, um, from the industry, it's interesting to, to un understand that uh, independent on, on their geographies, and this was actually another thing that w we, we tried to do, which was having all the geographies uh, in, in the room and uh, during the, the different symposiums and the, and the conference, the message was uh, mainly the same. And we already heard uh, this during these two days, uh, this, uh, the message. So uh, there is a fragmented regulatory landscape that needs to be, have uh, some standardized mechanisms and uh, we need to have information exchange and coordination between uh, the operators. Data sharing and transparency was uh, said um, uh, various times. For example, in space debris, um, an interesting point from, um, uh, from the industry is that 
to acquire capital and uh, to ensure their investments, they uh, they need to have um, somehow security and uh, from the um, from a legal perspective. So there is the regimes. So both the um, uh, the investors and both the the companies when they are putting their investments on, um, they feel more comfortable when you're wor working, for example, in space resources, to have this regulatory uh, framework already established. So both they were asking for um, uh, to have these regulations in space to breeze and space resources, and uh, and the other thing was the the future generations of civil society, how they can. They have to have also a role in um, uh, in these activities, and the, um, there was also uh, mentioned by during the, the, the different conferences on what we need to hear also the civil society. We need to hear um, uh, what is being done to have also their views implemented in uh, in the summit of the future. And so it was from the industry perspective we can see that the message is clear. Everybody is asking for uh, regulatory um, and legal aspects to be in place. They, they, they will be there. The industry will be working in space. There's no other way. But they want to know what are going to be the rules uh, down the road. Uh, so we already heard this uh, during this uh, conference here. And I think this is the main message that uh, we received from, uh, from the industry. Okay. Thank you. So we've heard from both Ryan and, and Hugo the efforts of states to incorporate um, civil society and industry inputs. Now I want to turn to industry. John, um, uh, how, how have Viasat and other commercial actors in your experience uh, in, the, in the industry worked to get um, efforts on space sustainability incorporated um, into multilateral discussions? Uh, and uh, how, how are you, um, uh, what, what roadblocks have you encountered in, this, in these engagements? Well, that's a great question. Um, I would say, uh, generally, uh, there's been outreach to the ministries, the regulators, the other influencers around the world. Um, and I would say we found open doors, uh, generally, as we've reached out. Um, UNOSA uh, has been terrific in terms of recognizing the issue and the need to act. Uh, the ITU has been very active as well. Matter of fact, I came here from Uganda where there was a symposium, a global symposium of regulators hosted by the ITU, where these sustainability topics were, were front and center. I think there are a lot of space agencies around the world uh, who are looking to create opportunities and advance innovation, who are very focused on this. I would say the, the one area where we perhaps ran into some initial reluctance is in some cases there were regulators that perhaps were focused on the next six months, the next 12 months, and really were more interested in, in getting authorizations out the door than thinking about the medium and long-term consequences. But I found that once we engaged and people started to focus on the issues, they too started to take a longer term mentality and think about the bigger picture. Um, so I, I would say it isn't really so much roadblocks, but an evolution. And I think of a comment you know, Ryan made about four years ago on a lot of these issues. If you would bring these up, I remember speaking to people in governments and they looked at you like you had four eyes. They had no idea what these issues were or why they should care. But the good news is they listened. And about two years ago, they started asking what it is we should do. And now, two years later, we're starting to deal with action. And there are a number of terrific initiatives going on. Um, I would mention the Astra Carta and the SMI as something that is really taking off. There's also an initiative called the Earth and Space Sustainability Initiative, which is something that's been endorsed by around 130 or 40 companies and thought leaders around the world. And for those of you following uh, things that are developing uh, in Europe, there's been activity on a new European space law, which is a new way to try to address some of these issues. So what's resonated? What are the kind of messages that have caused people to sit up and take notice? I think part of it relates to what I said at the beginning, 
with a recognition that the portion of space closest to Earth is a limited resource, there's a recognition of the need for inclusiveness in the global space economy. That everyone needs to be able to participate in this for the advancement of economies around the world, developed and developing nations alike. Um, and we can't have a situation where it's a winner-take-all mentality and some nations get left behind. That's not going to be a good result. I think there's also a rec recognition that space is different now than it was 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when we first started using it commercially. And, and we need to go beyond the actions we took in the past to ensure that many folks are able to take, care, take advantage of the benefits of space. So I think it's a good news story, and it's an evolution, and I think we're ahead of the curve, and we're a lot more ahead of the curve here than we were on the plastics issue. That's a very interesting perspective. Um, um, do you think we're ahead of the curve on the, on the uh, debris and uh, re-entry issues? Um, I think we have a way to go. And part of the reason I think we have a way to go on that is there's a lot of focus on things like debris cleanup. And I think what AstroScale is doing is wonderful. I don't want that misinterpreted, but I think we need to put even more focus on how we're populating space in the first instance. So that if we can populate space in a more efficient manner, we reduce the risk of creating a mess that someone needs to clean up. Right, yeah. and this brings in, of course, the whole economics of the space economy, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, moving then back to um, Anjali. So earlier on, you described the current status of the Astro Carta, and Astro Carta, as we all know, is one of a number of initiatives uh, in the space sector focused on establishing and promoting industry best practices for space sustainability. How can these initiatives be made to work together? How can they, and how can they fit in with the various governmental initiatives to promote space sustainability? Thank you. So the Astra Carta is really an urgent call to action and it seeks to unite the public and private sectors in a shared commitment to responsible use of space. Um, we, work, we work collaboratively with all stakeholders um, and it's really important that we don't duplicate the work. Um, increasingly, the SMI and the Astra Carta is being called on as the private sector voice in these forum and to interact with world leaders. Um, so if you go back to COP28, um, the SMI um, was instrumental in running the Business and Philanthropy Forum where we had over a thousand global CEOs interacting with world leaders at the same table and having those very difficult conversations. Um, Equally, we're interacting at the G7 and the G20, where the private sector is coming up with market signals and talking about what the private sector is doing, but then also what governments and policy need to do to create an enabling environment for us to all work together and really um, leverage each other's work. Um, so the private sector wants to be viewed as equal partners with governments and have the conversations at, the, uh, at an equal footing to really drive the agenda forward. And that's what the SMI and the Astra Carta look to do. Thank you. So I'd now like to shift the uh, perspective a little bit um, to look at the, um, uh, to ask our two panelists who are um, from government, uh, how governments incorporate private sector inputs into governmental discussions and engagements uh, in the multilateral fora. So, uh, Nakamura-san, uh, if you could uh, reflect on how has the Japanese government incorporated its commercial sector into space sustainability initiatives? Is it using policy and regulation to ensure that its goals for space sustainability are being carried out by commercial actors, or is it using other methods? And how does it translate this coordination into its international space governance engagements? Yeah, um, in the case of my government, uh, companies launching spacecraft here must obtain government permission, license, license, and among the legal requirements for permission are debris mitigation requirements, uh, which reflect the contents of the international guidelines like the UN, UN guidelines. Therefore, any spacecraft launched from Japan must meet the required standards of the UN guidelines. I believe most of the countries here 
uh, doing the same. Uh, on top of that, as an advanced space nation, uh, we are making additional efforts. For example, uh, we have introduced a sort of a set of licensing guidelines for on-orbit servicing. Um, this is the world's first effort to codify the requirements to be followed by companies engaged in on-orbit servicing and active debris removal. Obviously, this is an outcome of discussions with the industry here. Second, the Japanese government is strongly committed to the development of innov innovative methods such as ISO standards and the space sustainability rating and others. In a sense, these are joint efforts taken by both the government and the industry. Uh, finally, the cabinet office of the Japanese government uh, has invited industry representatives to participate in its advisory committee to engage them in the policy formation regarding space sustainability. In the case of debris mitigation, uh, streng strengthening countermeasures is costly, and it is not surprising that some companies uh, want, to, want to do so, but others do not. So um, the close communication uh, with the industry, as well as uh, providing them op opportunity to give, get the input from the industrial uh, principal actors are quite in indispensable for the policy formation. The cabinet office here is also quite active in hosting international conferences in this field. And this year marks the ninth conference focused on space sustainability, which took place earlier this year. Uh, this summit, this particular summit, is also part of the Japanese government's efforts to strengthen space sustainability initiatives with the participation of industry. Um, uh, so I talked about the, our engagement of the Japanese industry in terms of the policy formation. But uh, let me briefly touch upon our additional effort to enhance our uh, joint effort to, uh, to improve the space sustainability, which is the engagement of the developing countries. Uh, because we have provided the funds to the UN USA uh, to support the development of legal systems in developing countries. And one of the most important items is a legal system for debris mitigations. So we are committed to enhance, enhancing the legal re regimes of developing countries as well. Thank you. Thank you. So Ryan, I'd like to go back to um, some of the comments you made in your last intervention. Um, and building on this theme of international space governance, in your view, how can we make the existing multilateral fora more agile and effective? Uh, what, where, where can we do better, and can we adapt best practices from other domains to the, the, the sp circumstances of space? Sure. I, I mean, I certainly think you know that there's always room for improvement, and, and you know, I think uh, previously kind of touched on the idea of being a bit more interactive. I think in general countries could probably benefit, and I'm including my own, about being a bit more willing to try things and, and you know, to, to commit to certain things that, you know, may seem, um, can make countries seem a, a bit wary to do at times. But, you know, I think another important aspect of that as well is to realize that there are a bunch of forums that exist and a bunch of forums that have separate mandates, separate expertise, and, you know, have already poured in many hours and lots of work to try to address many different challenges. And I think it's important for all these different committees to, to be aware of what those efforts are and to try, you know, to A, not duplicate those efforts, but also coordinate and understand where there are areas of overlap that, you know, perhaps they can work jointly together on. You know, I know, um, uh, you know, IKO is very interested in the ideas of how, you know, re-entering objects may kind of affect air traffic which is, you know, a very reasonable concern. And, you know, UNUSA certainly is, is, and COPUS in general, is interested in re-entries in general. And, you know, how can those two organizations work together in a way to try to find a solution to that or a way to address that issue without, you know, both doing work separately that may conflict with each other um, and really trying to have kind of a synergistic effort. So I think a lot of coordination between these international bodies, I think, would be um, very useful. And then I think just trying to maybe move a bit away from 
kind of statements to more action oriented things. You know, one thing that I think that you and USA did very recently that was uh, helpful, and I believe it was a, a project that was funded by the UK, was they hosted an, an SSA workshop um, where it wasn't just, you know, countries reading statements about how important SSA is and what are the, the recent initiatives. It was actual SSA operators giving a, a, a practical tutorial about here's how you use the system, here's what it's used for, here's how you make a login, like things like that, that actual practical, hands-on tutorials that help countries that may not be as familiar with that, you know, do a real capacity building initiative. So I think focusing on those, those aspects in general may be very helpful. Great. Thank you. So I see that uh, time is catching up with us. We've got eight minutes left. So I'd like to do two quick rounds of the panel. Um, the, in the first, I want to get your thoughts on um, how we can make these uh, various uh, initiatives and fora um, make sure that, that they're all working together and not against each other on, on these issues. And finally, uh, one key takeaway that you would like the audience to leave uh, from this panel. So um, starting first with uh, your thoughts on how we can make sure that uh, all these various initiatives are working together and not against each other. If we can just go down the road. Please. Okay. Yep. Um, I think developed, developed countries will continue to set the tone for universal rules either alone or together with like-minded countries. Also, um, private initiatives are also going forward. Uh, what is important is to keep paying efforts to gain the support of as many countries as possible at the United Nations and other fora through transparent discussions while continuing such norm-creating initiatives. In the field of advanced technology, like outer space, Sometimes the United Nations is considered synonymous of inefficiency. It is naive to think that universal rules can be quickly established at the United Nations. However, when rules and the seeds of rules are being created in piecemeal fashion in various fora, it is also important that they be exposed to the United Nations and other, other fora and that the elements of universal rules be added one by one uh, through discussions. I will stop there. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good point. So the UN is, is a good forum for socializing these rules. I think yeah, that's broader the, yes, that's the case. Adopters rather than necessarily formulating them. Um, so the, the private room. sector, I think, is really, really key here. And then the learnings of the private sector and then the interaction um, with the United Nations and the key leaders and the um, regulation and the government forum. So it's really about what actually has to happen to deploy the capital to really accelerate um, the journey on sustainable use of space and then also all the, all the implications for sustainability on Earth. What parts of the capital structure are needed to be mobilised? How can you do that on, in blended structures? How can you de-risk using insurance? How can you use early stage capital? Private equity, do you need debt financing, equity financing? All those conversations need to become much more mainstream because they're the conversations that are happening in the capital markets anyway. So I think the learnings from there and the models and the economic models have to somewhat be translated to the space industry, which shouldn't be op operating in a vacuum because it is becoming more and more integrated. Yep. All great points. John? I'd like to pick up on that modeling question. I think it's critical that we, we make our policy decisions based on data and based on modeling. And I think the best way to pull people together on these issues is have facts. Let's not guess about what we think is going to work. Let's not going to argue about whether your idea is better than mine. Let's start to get the scientists and the experts quantifying, building the best models we can, and then basing our policy decisions on the results of those models. Absolutely, couldn't agree with you more. Evidence-based policy is definitely need that. Ryan? You know, I think we talked about how, you know, it's useful for different branches of the UN to kind of coordinate and talk amongst uh, themselves about the initiatives. But I think within governments, too, that is becoming increasingly important, especially for space. You know, speaking for the U.S. government, you know, we have folks who deal with the ITU, people who deal with copious, people who deal with the disarmament commissions. And, you know, I think as space has become bigger and more important and more pressing, we found a greater need to coordinate amongst ourselves to understand and better understand what's going on here versus here versus here so that you know we can all be on the same page because 
you know, governments are not monoliths in the sense that they do exist in different departments and people who may not be aware of everything that's going on in other aspects, which can create problems of, you know, conflicting information and this and that. So I think coordination within governments too is becoming increasingly important on space issues. Absolutely. Hugo? Well, uh, we can see in the, in the different forums where, uh, where we are or in the different conferences and also uh, all of these groups that have been working together to, uh, to think about the different issues that regulation, coordination, sharing data and transparency are um, the main takeaways that always uh, come, come together. So I, re I think right now, if you continue the discussion, uh, the outcomes will all be, all be the same. So it, there's a point and to, to link also with uh, what was already said, we need to com start to converge all of these groups and all of these uh, ideas that are written in, in different uh, documents. And the right point to, to do this conversion is at COPUS at UN. This is uh, the multilateral forum for, uh, for space. Uh, it has been like this uh, for uh, several decades. And uh, it took us in, in the right way, in the right path to, to work all together in space. So I think we should make use of all of this um, uh, knowledge that was created, uh, all of these gr groups that have been created. But at some point, they should start to have come to couples, the member states, um, um, perhaps we should sit at couples and, and listen and try to converge uh, to a point where uh, all of these uh, can, uh, can become uh, ways to, to, to work in space in a better way. Thank you. Well, you've actually kind of preempted my, my closing question, which was going to be, um, what is your key takeaway message for the proponents of these various fora initi and initiatives? So perhaps we'll do one last lightning round. Key takeaway. So, yep. Was that your... Wait, wait. Okay, uh, I, can, I can do. Well, the main takeaway is that uh, right now the geopolitics perhaps is not very uh, positive to work all together. But probably it was not very different from when the Outer Space Treaty was being discussed and being written, right? So um, we have to do it. And wherever, whatever we are doing today, we are not doing for ourselves, we are doing for our the next generation, for our grandkids. So uh, we need to put our egos aside uh, because our grandkids, they will not ask about the egos of the grandparents and grandmothers. Uh, they just want to know that we can work with space and they want to have the same sort of living that we have today. I mean, what Hugo said, but <laughs> I, if, if I had to add something to that, it's that, you know, multilateralism isn't just a nice thing to have. It, it's really indispensable to, to trying to move these issues ahead. And, you know, in, in times that are fraught geopolitically, sometimes it's really only these fora where you have these outlets to have these discussions with all the relevant players. And, and I think that's more important now than, than it has been for quite a while. Absolutely. John? Uh, I go back to a holistic approach. Uh, we need to stop looking at how we're consuming space on a spacecraft by spacecraft basis and look at the total impact of all of the thousands or tens of thousands of spacecraft that are getting deployed. And I go back to the plastics issue. If I threw one plastic bottle into Tokyo Bay, it probably doesn't matter. But if we took all the plastic bottles that are consumed in Tokyo this week and dump them in the bay, everyone would be aghast. But we're not looking at space that way, and we need to. Great point. Um, urgent action is needed, and it's action. So we can spend a lot of time talking, but actually we need to start doing. And I think the lessons from Earth show that we actually have to act much sooner um, and not wait um, for all of the evidence, but I do think it has to be fact-based as well. It's also a pledge really for future generations, as you mentioned as well, that we do this responsibly. And it's also, we have to think of a mindset of default sustainable. So sustainability is also sustainability of economic models, sustainability of future generations. So everything has to be rewired somewhat. Yeah, yeah all great points. And uh, as you said, you know, we don't, Time is of the essence. We don't have the luxury of decades to sit on this problem. And last word to you, Nakamura-san. OK. Um, we already share uh, the similar sense of urgency in, t in terms of this, this current status of the state sustainability. So let us uh, keep doing the best uh, in respective places uh, to uh, think about, come up with the measures and the norms to cope with the challenges we face. But sometimes, let us get together to compare not and um, to, to, to enhance our coordination among us. That's my, my principal message.
Thank you. Thank you. So there you have it. Um, some compelling takeaways from this panel. And unfortunately, time has caught up with us. So I will now move to conclude this panel. So please join me in thanking our panelists.